Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. I'm so thrilled to be here with Marjan Kamali, Bill Martin and Jane Healy, who we're gonna be talking about um, historical fiction today. And um, before I get to um, our conversation, I just wanted to say a few things. One is that um, this is recording and it's playing live on Facebook. And you can ask questions through the Q&A or on Facebook if, you're, um, if you catch us there. Um, I would like to thank our partners in this program, the Newton Free Library and the Medway Public Library, and as always, the friends of the Ashland Library who support all of our um, programming. So um, I'm really pleased to be working with other librarians and librarians to uh, bring off awesome author visits to the communities. Um, again, you can put your questions in the Q&A and um, use the chat for any comments. Feel free to let us know how you're doing. And if you have any tech issues, I'll be paying attention to that. Um, you can buy signed books from any of our authors from Haley Booksellers. I will put a link in the chat for that. And if originally we were gonna do this uh, program in person in Ashland, and um, you know, then you could have gotten the book signed by the authors and have a little chat with them. But um, signed books are gold wherever you get them from. So um, just wanted to put a plug in for the signed book thing. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I am not going to do a huge long introduction because I think you'd rather hear from the authors than from me. So I'll just tell you a little tidbit about each author that I thought was interesting in their bio. Um, for one, Bill Martin is called by the Providence Journal, the king of the historical thriller. So I want to hear all about that. How did that happen? Um, Jane Healy is the host of the historical happy hour where she uh, chats with historical fiction authors. And I think it sounds like drinks a lot, but that's another <laughs> story for another Not day. Much, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. Um, and Marjan, I think is so interesting because she grew up, was born in Turkey to Iranian parents and has lived in, wait a minute, where's my notes? Um, Kenya, Germany, Turkey, Iran, and the U.S. And as I was telling um, our authors earlier today, she actually wrote her first book, um, The Together Tea, right, at the Cary Library where I used to work. So I feel like a, I feel like a deep connection with her. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get started with some questions and uh, feel free to, like I said, put your questions in the chat and throughout I will be um, moderating those questions with the author. So I'm just going to start with a quick Tell us a little bit about yourself and your books, and I'll sort of call on people so that you um, all get a chance to chat. So I'm going to start with Marjan on that. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your book? Sure. Well, um, thanks, Nina, for having me, and I'm so excited to be here with Jane and with Bill. And I know we were going to do it in person, but this is also awesome because I see there are people from all over the country here, a couple I know, so that's awesome. Um, the Stationery Shop is my second book. Together, Tea was the first. And as you said, I did grow up all over the world. You can add Australia and Switzerland to that list, Mina. Um, but The Stationery Shop is a love story. It's about two teenagers who um, meet in 1953 in Iran when they're 17. And they have a whirlwind romance and are set to get married. But on the day that they are to meet, the country erupts in a violent coup d'etat and Iran's trajectory is changed forever. And I did a lot of research for this book. I wasn't familiar with the coup of 53, but I learned a lot. And as I wrote it, of course, it became a very emotional sort of story of lost love. We then see them reunite 60 years later in New England. So that's just a little bit about the stationery shop. And it's very exciting. It's gotten a reception beyond my wildest dreams. And if all goes well, it's gonna be adapted into a series for HBO. So fingers crossed, yes. <laughs> awesome, oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Bill, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I've been doing this now for over 40 years. Uh, went to Hollywood in the 1970s to become a movie director. Uh, uh, wrote screenplays that nobody wanted to produce. So I decided at the advice of an agent who said, the way you write, you want to write a novel, uh, to write a novel. And that was uh, 
Back Bay, which is back there on the wall. And uh, that book did extremely well. Uh, and it remains in print to this day. And uh, that fortunately meant that I didn't have to have a real job after that. And that I could come up here into this office every day and, uh, and write, uh, well, now 12 novels. And uh, along, with a, along with one really excellent, if I do say so myself, PBS documentary on the life of George Washington. And uh, one of the cheesiest horror movies of all time, which uh, I will perhaps speak about later if you if you ask nicely. But one of the good things about uh, about those screenplays was that one of them uh, turned into my twelfth, my eleventh novel, which was Bound for Gold. Um, so I keep everything. Uh, it's a lesson for all writers: um, keep it either in your head or in your desk drawer. Good to know. Wow. But all that, what goes around comes around too. <laughs> um, Jane. Hello. Hi. Hi. So um, I am, for, first of all, thank you, Mina, for doing this and for having us. I know we had to kind of pivot to online, but um, so good to see everyone. And I'm a huge fan of Bill and Marjan. So it's an honor to be here with them tonight. I am the author of um, three novels. The Saturday Evening Girls Club came out in 2017, and that was based on, it's based on the true story of the Saturday Evening Girls Club, which was a group of immigrant women in Boston's North End at the turn of the 20th century. I had written an article about them for Boston Magazine, and um, as Mina and I were discussing, that book took me about 10 years to, to finish and get published. Um, my second novel, The Town Girls, came out in 2019. It's based on um, the Red Cross Club Mobile Girls of World War II. It's based on their letters and diaries, true stories. Um, and then my third novel came out in April of this year, and it's called The Secret Stealers. And it's about um, the women of the Office of Strategic Services, which was the precursor to the CIA during World War II, including um, Julia Child. So, so that came out in April. And then uh, my next one is going to come out hopefully by the end of 2022, but I, I have to finish writing it first. Um, and that's going to be called, tentatively titled The American Actress. And it's about um, Drew Layton, who was a 1930s um, B-list actress who ended up working um, in the underground network in France, getting pilots out of France um, during World War II. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm looking forward to that one. Um, I was um, wondering if either of your second two books, the, well, the one that's just the Secret Stealers or the, the new one, have any connection to Boston? Because it seemed like your first two books did. Yeah, I feel like with each book, I'm moving a little farther away to, from Boston. The Beantown Girls, the three main characters were from Boston. Um, the Secret Stealers, one of the main characters was originally from Boston, but none of the book takes place in Boston. So, um, so yeah, always kind of weaving in some little Boston detail. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, because we're here, you know, and um, it, it was that nice connection for us as a reader to see like, you know, our town, you know, and books we were reading. Um, so I'm going to ask what drew you to writing historical fiction as opposed to, let's say, science fiction or romance or um, some other sort of subgenre? And I'm going to start with Bill for this one. Well, uh, it's simply something that excites you when you're a kid, I think. I was never very interested in science fiction when I was a kid. I have friends who absolutely loved sci-fi and um, friends who today are all excited about the movie version of Dune, which um, didn't really work for me all that much. But um, uh, when I was growing up, I was in love with the big movies and the big historical novels of the period, perhaps because uh, the characters appeared to be larger than life. The events were uh, broad and spectacular events painted on big canvases. And yet, if you looked closely, uh, let's say at a movie like Lawrence of Arabia, you saw a character who was a lot more psychologically complex than, um, than he might first appear. And uh, I guess that's what, what drew me when I was younger, was the spectacle and the excitement, but that, that sense that things were a little bit more, a little bit deeper if we, and, and a little bit more um, uh, 
filled with human frailty if we looked closely enough. And, and then of course, today, when I sit down to write something, um, first of all, the old, the old idea about write what you know, uh, to me is don't write what you know, write where you wanna go, what you want, who you wanna meet. And when mm. you get there, you know, what, and what you want to learn. And um, I still feel that the past speaks to us and uh, we just have to listen and write it down. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just going to interrupt and say that I'm a romance reader, so um, I must be looking for Fabio. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do love historical fiction, and um, and we're going to be talking. We're going to be talking about the appeals of it in a minute. Um, Jane, what what drew you to historical fiction? Um, I I loved. I've always loved historical fiction, so I think that's certainly part of it. And but also I I love having stories historical stories as a jumping off point and i love discovering those like little nuggets of history that no one's ever learned about before and and being able to weave that into the book like little vignettes about real people and like i said i mentioned julia child and william donovan is in the um was the head of the oss in world war ii and so a lot of really interesting stories about him he was kind of a character so um so yeah i like I always uh, joke with my friends who write contemporary fiction. I'm like, like, what do you, you just like make people up and you have like nothing to go on. You're just like move them around. I, like, I don't, I, I don't even understand that. I love using the history as a jumping off point for story. Mm -hmm. So we, um, for you is sort of what you read was what you wanted to write. Does that sound? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it def definitely. I mean, I I read widely. I love sci-fi. I love mysteries and thrillers. But um, but I've always been drawn to historical fiction. It's probably my favorite genre. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marjan. Um, yeah, I think I kind of fell into it by accident. I never intended to write historical fiction. When my first book came out in 2013, Together Tea. It's, uh, it was an semi-autobiographical story of a mother and daughter who leave Iran after the revolution of 79 and the war with Iraq and they come to the US. And when my book was coming out, I remember the assistant to my editor said, it's really cool, it's in the historical fiction genre. And I remember thinking, what? I didn't write historical fiction. And she said, well, it's 79, that's history. And I thought, oh, wow. Well, she was 24 and I realized that is history, I suppose. 1979 is considered history. But then I just embraced it. And for my second book, I did what Bill said, uh, not write what I know, but what I wanted to learn. And what I really wanted to learn was what Iran was like before the 79 revolution, before the 70s, before everything we see constantly, you know, the Shah, the downfall, but what it was like historically in the 20th century. So I deliberately focused on 1953 because I knew there was this huge coup. And I think I love writing historical fiction because it feels like combining research and creative writing. Like there's just this, this immense satisfaction in learning so much as I do my own research about this country or a history that I just didn't know. So I think it, it adds that layer, kind of like what Jane was saying. We're not just dealing with making people up and moving them around. There's this anchoring in the real world that I really do enjoy. Mm -hmm. So that's an, in, an interesting, um, for everybody, the perspective of from the writer. Um, what do you think are the, what's the appeal for historical fiction to the reader? Um, as opposed to you know uh, what you've been doing is writing, um, and I think I'm going to start with Jane on this one. Um, well, I think it's escapist for sure. I think you know it takes you to a different time and place. I I've been doing mostly on Zoom doing talks about the Secret Stealers, and at the end of the talk, I say you know um, World War II was a very difficult time in history, and yet as a country, as a as a world we came out the other side and and it, it and it turned out okay and i think that we're in another weird time in history and i think it's inspiring to see people of different eras who go through difficult times and and come out the other side and and do all right in the end mm -hmm. thank you um marjan 
Yeah, I think for readers, um, it's similar to the same sense of satisfaction that one gets as a writer. I think readers of historical fiction also love to learn. And so, you know, if you're if you're going to sit down and read a book, that means you're ready to be interactive. If you want to just veg out, you would probably plop yourself down in front of the TV or scroll mindlessly through the many timelines of your social media. But by the time you're sitting down to read a book, it's an escape, yes, but it's also highly interactive. So I think readers of all fiction enjoy that sense of interplay with the with the narr narration, but the readers of historical fiction are kind of up for a bit more. And I do get feedback from readers saying, I loved learning this. I loved knowing this. After I read the story, I then Googled and I did my own research and it led me to learn more. So I think, yeah, there's a huge hunger to understand the past because of course it informs the present constantly and there's nothing new except the history you do not know, which is one of the epigraphs to the stationary shop. And I really think that's true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Bill? As, Fa as Faulkner said, um, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. Right. And we are the product of the stories that we tell ourselves. And th whether those stories are set in the future or set in the past, uh, people turn to them in order to understand what it means to be human. Uh, in any era, in any location, whether it's in Iran or whether it's in Boston. And uh, that's, I think, the overarching reason why people read any kind of fiction. But historical fiction, uh, which if we think about it, and go all the way back to Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey, those are historical fiction. And Shakespeare was writing historical fiction. And, uh, and Dickens wrote a little bit of historical fiction, although most of his books were social commentary on the England of the era. But um, uh, in, in all of these instances, uh, authors have shown you what other human beings have endured at other moments in time, when those people believed that what they were experiencing was the worst thing that anybody's ever experienced, like World War II. Um, and as, as Jane said, they, they were able to come out on the other side of that experience. Uh, and if they can endure that and make the most of whatever they were, they had thrown at them, we too can survive and thrive and continue forward. Even, you know, when you think about the, the, the pandemic uh, that we're experiencing, uh, think back a hundred years, the, uh, the, the influenza epidemic of 1918, my, my grandmother died in that one. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that epidemic was, easily as horrible as this one has been, except that they didn't have the science and they didn't have the vaccines and all of the other things that, uh, that the tools that we've had. And uh, so there was plenty to learn just by, if somebody had written a novel about the 1918 influenza epidemic, it might've been a very helpful thing to people at this point in, uh, in our history. But people so like, People like good stories, whether they're historical or contemporary or set in the future. And our instinct has always been to look to the past, I think, at least the three of us. Mindy says, well said, Martin. <laughs> um, Thank you, Mindy. I have to say that um, I find it interesting that um, you've talked about historical fiction being a good escape when I think of it as close to, you know, reading nonfiction as there is. So like, there is this sort of like, oh my gosh, that really happened as you were just saying, Bill, like, the, you know, World War II that in, in Jane, you know, your stories and, you know, the, the uh, things that happened in Iran. So like, to me, like it, it's, 
it's learning, but it's also not as much of an escape because these things really happen. And then you add your twist to it of having a fictionalized story interwoven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I would add it is an escape because I can't tell you the number of times people have written to me saying, I loved escaping to another time and place. So people want to escape our current reality and whether they're learning about a past that's just as bad or worse or a past that's glorified and glamorous and magical, it's still an escape from our current reality. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. That also is very well said. <laughs> you know, because I was wondering about that because I do love historical fiction, but I don't always pick it up because it doesn't take it doesn't always take me out of my own reality because it is you know real real in so many ways. Um, so this is kind of a weird question, and I and maybe you can help me interpret it because it was in my head. Is do you think that there is a gender gap in people who read historical fiction? Are there more women or more men that read it, and why? Um, do you think that that is, if there is? Um, and I think I'm gonna start with Marjan on this one. Um, well, there's certainly a gender gap with fiction in general. So women read more fiction than men do, but with historical fiction, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know where the, the kind of numbers fall. I know that um, I, have, I have both male and female readers and maybe if you want to be completely stereotypical, perhaps the reason they pick up the book might be different. A lot of, you know, my younger female readers love the love story. And I have, you know, men write to me about the coup and everything they too know about the coup. So I don't know if there is a gender gap with historical fiction. I know there is with fiction in general. Hmm. Interesting. Bill? No, I think that's fair. I, I think that that's 70% of fic, fiction titles, uh, at least this is the statistic that's been quoted to me, 70% uh, of the fiction titles sold today are, are bought by women. Um, I'm not sure how the breakdown works with historical fiction. And, you know, I don't sit around worrying about it. It's, it's just, uh, it's a fact of life. And my job is to write the best story that I can. And um, I know that some readers will not be as interested, for example, in uh, battle tactics in a battle in the Civil War as they are in uh, the characters back home in Boston and what they're doing. But uh, in every scene, you simply bring the best that you have to bear and, um, and, and hope that you will uh, transcend uh, genre and, and gender. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's the best thing that you can hope to do. And, and while more males perhaps gravitate to historical fiction than to, um, uh, than to other kinds of fiction, I think that um, I think that the best thing to do is just write the best book that you can and not worry about it. Absolutely. Jane, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I think that is great advice, Bill. And I think uh, it's funny. My, my first two novels had the title had girls in the title. So mm -hmm. I mean, my, my audience is definitely like a lot of books that had girl or girls in the title in the past five years. But um, my audience definitely skews female. What's been interesting about the Secret Stealers, I think it's because of the topic of the Office of Strategic Services um, appeals more to male readers. And also the fact that it's a spy thriller. Um, I, I, I definitely have had more male readers for this book than the other two. And I've heard from more male readers this time. And, and that's been really rewarding. Um, it's nice to see that um, I'm reaching a little bit wider audience this time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, my cat has anxiety and he's crying in the background. I apologize <laughs> if you can hear that. Thank you. I like it. <laughs> I'll try, I'm oh. trying to get my daughter to get him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> my cat's going to be screaming for food in about 10 minutes. So we're, we all have a little chorus. Is that, is that when we finish up? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Dinner time. Um, so I, I, maybe that was a little bit of a trick question because 
um, we've had historical fiction um, book clubs, and those are the really the only ones that we do get both male and female um, uh, club members because exactly what you said, Marjan, is that um, they come to it for different reasons, and um, they get what they want out of it, uh, out of the books, because that's what they're looking for. And it, to me, like, it's amazing, like, you can reach so many people and so many interests just in one book. Um, <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to move on to, um, we do have some questions from people, and I will get to them. Uh, I just want to let you know that I have a few more, and then I'll, and I'll get to uh, audience wins. Um, I wonder if you found that you're, uh, there's an appetite or pressure to write more inclusive work. And put that in quotes because I think all of your books are inclusive. Like they do talk about things that um, that are, um, you know, bigger picture of the world kind of thing. Um, because as I, as I was saying, in, in, your, in my opinion, you're naturally inclusive given your subject matters. And so I'm just wondering if there you felt like there's been a shift in the last few years over over this um, being more inclusive of the actual history, the bigger picture history of what's gone on in the world. Um, and I think I'm starting with Bill this time. Um, do you mean do you mean sort of racially inclusive? Uh, I'm not sure what the question what the question is. I've I have tried in all of my books um to tell stories of people from every walk of life uh to be as um universally aware of the the um of, of people as i possibly can be um when people say um as as a at uh, one of the main narrators in a novel that I wrote about George Washington called Citizen Washington um, is a Mount Vernon slave. And he's in the room when George Washington is born and he's in the room when George Washington's body lies in state at Mount Vernon after, after his death. He knows Washington across Washington's whole life. People said, well, you know, how can you write from the point of view of a slave? And I said, well, you know, this is part of the job. And the job is to exercise your imagination, uh, no matter what. I think the cat likes that idea. Um, <laughs> I'm so, I'm Hell, that I'm cat, so Halloween was la last night. But, you know, <laughs> your, your, job, your job is to, is, is to try and, it's why people read fiction, is to live other lives and experience other sets of um, emotions than they might have experienced um, in their own lives. And so your job as a novelist is to, is to attempt to see through all of those other points of view. So I, I don't feel any pressure. I don't worry about it. Um, I just simply keep, once I've settled on an idea, that's the idea I'm going to write and whatever serves the story and serves the development of all the characters is what I will turn to and, and, and fall back on. Excellent, Jane? Um, yeah, so I, I agree with what, um, what you were saying, Bill, and I think that we're really in a great time in historical fiction where there's been a lot of lesser known stories of women coming out and lesser known stories of people of color coming out. And, um, and those stories are being celebrated and written about in historical fiction, I think more, more in the past few years than I've seen in a, in a long time. Um, so yeah, I, I think that I think we're in a good time for that. And I think it's only going to get better. I hope so. Because <laughs> I'm um, loving it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it gives a fuller picture of the actual history, I exactly. think. Different to make sure that everybody. Mm -hmm. yes. Exactly. Marjan? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, um, you know, 20 years ago when I was first getting my MFA and starting out, historical fiction in the U.S. was more on the Western past. And so if you were writing historical fiction, you were writing about World War II from, you know, a European point of view or American point of view or the Civil War or American history or British history. And I think in recent years, we've kind of opened it up to a more global history. So readers are interested in reading about 
the history of other countries much more mm -hmm. and the appetite has changed. So um, today somebody might pick up a book and say, yeah, you know, I kind of want to know what happened in 1953 Iran, whereas I think 20 years ago that wasn't as a common a preference, but we've become much more global in our appetites in what we ingest on screen and also in fiction. Mm -hmm. Right. It's uh, it's kind of a new era uh, brought about by a lot of different reasons. Um, I'm going to ask one more of my questions and I'll get to audience questions because they're really good. Um, and, and we're going into some questions about research. Um, so I want to ask you all uh, three questions. What's the most interesting tidbit that you've learned doing research? What's the most surprising? And what was the most hidden? Like the most like, you know, you had to really dig for it. I'm going to start with Jane. Oh, you're muted. Oh, it's because the cat. Sorry. Um, <laughs> should I ask one answer one of those? I have to think about that. Um, well, I'll tell you one of the, one that comes to mind uh, that I wasn't able to fit into the Secret Stealers um, just because it didn't fit. But um, Julia Child was a member of the OSS and she worked in several offices. And one of her jobs was coming up with a recipe for shark repellent for submarines, which I thought was so bizarre and kind of amazing given how her the rest of her life turned out. But um, but it just it did not fit within the narrative, um, you know, historically, factually. But but I thought that was a really fun, fun fact about her. Did she ever discover one? Yes, they did. They actually did. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. Marjana, can you top that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that, actually. I, I don't know if I can top it, but um, I know when I was researching, you know, my dad told me that when he was growing up, when he was a teenager in Tehran, they would go to the stationery shop, which also sold books. And the owner of the stationery shop would pass love notes that the teenagers would write to one another. He would put place them in between the pages of the books and give them to the teenagers. And obviously this is before there was texting. This is at a time when they would feel awkward calling the home of their crush. So I thought that was just such a cute romantic notion that you would pass uh, love notes in between pages of the book. That was my, I guess, interesting one. And the surprising one for me was, oh my gosh, uh, seeing how linked Iran and the US's histories are, especially in the 20th century, seeing like just how involved the US was in the coup of 53. It, it reads like a spy thriller when you go through the documents, like literally a million dollars in a briefcase in a taxi cab with like, I think Kermit Roosevelt like lying down in Tehran trying to get through the guard. So all of that was just super surprising. And sometimes history is weirder than fiction. <laughs> That's true. Um, Bill, you've written about so many different eras and times and topics. I, I, right. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> at the end of the Civil War, uh, there was a parade in Washington, D.C., and it, it's a climactic scene in a book I wrote called The Lincoln Letter. And um, this parade was meant to celebrate the Army of the Potomac uh, and, uh, and the Army of the West, Grant and Sherman's two armies. And for two days, this parade moved from Capitol Hill, down Pennsylvania Avenue, past the reviewing stand at the White House. It was the last time that these soldiers would be together. Now, 100,000 men marched in this parade. Uh, the Union Army at the time was about a million men. About 100,000 of those uh, troops were what were called the United States Colored Troops, the Black Freedmen, the Massachusetts um, 54th, the, the Glory Regiment, et cetera. And they had enlisted in huge numbers, shown tremendous courage. And 
in this grand parade in March of 18, in May of 1865, uh, that was to put the cap on the Civil War, not a single black troop marched in two days down those down Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, it to me is one of the great um, ironies of American history. Those United States troops, colored troops, had their own parade in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, a few months later. A, a parade that reenactors from the uh, those regiments will um, even today uh, reenact uh, on an annual basis. But what it suggests to you. A single fact like that, and a lot of historians didn't know this either. Uh, friends of mine, once I had begun to read a little bit about it, I said, wow, I didn't know that. Um, it suggests the, the racial troubles that might lie ahead for the United States. Uh, even though they had fought to free the slaves, they still weren't prepared to march with them at a critical, um, critical and celebratory moment in American history. Mm -hmm. I, I and, the job, and, and, and the job that we have as writers of historical fiction, and particularly if you're, as I'm, I write American historical fiction, I tell the American story from many different points of view. The job is to tell the best of, of American history and to tell you the worst of it as well, to give you uh, multiple perspectives. And, um, you know, I guess that's why I feel that this, the, this great um, uh, brouhaha about um, critical race theory is, to me, when I sit down to write a book about American history, like a book about Lincoln, uh, I, I tell you the tr whatever truth I can, I can uncover, and whatever the truth is for my characters. Mm -hmm. And that's the job that we all have. Right. I think that's, I think that's really fascinating because again, maybe 20 years ago, somebody wouldn't have dug that deep. An author wouldn't have dug that deep because they were telling a particular story and, and maybe those facts weren't as available. Well, so I've been, I, I've been doing it for, for, for 40 years. You know, when we talk, we talk about perspectives in Cape Cod, that novel begins from the point of view of the pilgrims. What is driving them? They're on that Mayflower. They're on that ship that's come down the 42nd parallel and is arriving at the sand hills of Truro and is going to turn south, run into the shoals, turn back around north and drop anchor in what will become Provincetown. The very next scene is from the point of view of one of the Wampanoags on the beach, looking out. And basically, I, I, he, he, he says um, in so many words, more of them I hear, good Lord, when will they ever stop? You know, so you're going to get both, both perspectives in, the, in that novel. And, yeah, well, so I'm gonna say 50 years. <laughs> okay, good, writing. that's fine, that's fine. That <laughs> predates I, my writing career, so we're, <laughs> we're good. Well, I think I think it's it's brave to have been doing this for that long, for however long you've been writing, and and really trying to have the the full perspectives. Um, and not everybody does, I guess, not everybody was doing it. Um, so, Kim asks, how much travel, and obviously not during COVID, um, to current day locations from history is involved in your research? And I think I'm going to start with Marjan on this one. Um, well, for my first book for Together Tea, I did travel to Iran and I went there a couple of times. And my first book, like Jane's, also took 10 years to write. So there is a lot of time to do that. Um, and I interviewed people. I made sure I traveled throughout the country. I didn't just stay in the capital city. I went to Isfahan. I went to Shiraz. I, I tried to really capture the sights and sounds and sense of the country. So there was travel involved and there was also memory involved. Um, for the stationery shop, I didn't travel because I really haven't been back in about 10 years. So, um, 
I traveled via my father mostly. I interviewed him at great length. I also interviewed other elders in my family who were in Iran in 1950, you know, in the 50s, in 1953 in particular. And I think through my dad, I traveled probably better than I could have if I'd actually had a time machine because he really opened up and shared with me not just the history, but, you know, things like what people were wearing, the music they were listening to, the tangos and the waltzes, um, the specific pastries they were eating in the cafes, the names of the drinks. He really brought to life that time period. And the biggest compliment is when a person who actually lived there during that time writes to me and says, you took me back to my youth. That's a huge compliment because they're the people I'm scared of the most. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up for them. So, yeah. That is a great compliment. Bill? Um, the research is always fun. Uh, and I decided a long time ago that I was only ever going to write novels in which the research was fun. Uh, travel, travel always is, is exciting. And uh, um, I, I think that you, you learn an enormous amount by walking the ground, whether you're walking a battlefield or walking an old street where there might be one building left from a period that you've... Uh, uh, that you've planned to write about, but the lay of the light is still the same and the way the sound echoes might still be the same. And, um, you know, I have a great time researching the minutia of things like um, in my new, and the music too. My new book is uh, called December 41. And it's about a, um, uh, uh, the, the three weeks right after Pearl Harbor between December 8th and Christmas of 1941. Um, there's a Nazi assassin on the loose in the United States. I'm not going to tell you who his target is. You'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly though. But I just put together a playlist of the music I listened to and the music that the characters listen to in the book because the characters are... You know, they're Americans just waking up to the reality of war, and they're still thinking about uh, Glenn Miller and, um, uh, and Tommy Dorsey. Do you know that the uh, number one song, it went to number one on the Billboard chart on December 7th, 1941, not that anybody noticed, was Chattanooga Choo Choo. Um, that's in the book, of course, because people will love a detail like that. But we, we tracked down. Uh, at a, in a railroad museum, uh, because part of the, the middle part of the book takes place on the, the train going between Los Angeles and Washington, uh, we found the dining car of the actual train that the characters ride on, on the Super Chief, which was known as the Grand Hotel on Wheels. And, it, and uh, we just, my wife and I just love doing that sort of thing, um, traveling around and and absorbing the atmosphere and, and then using my imagination to, to, to get back into the past. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and then there are newspapers too. Read a lot of newspapers. I'm sure you guys do too. Yeah, you're missing a lot of nodding. Jane? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I was fortunate with the Secret Stealers. Um, I had been to Paris before, but I knew that Paris was almost going to be like another character in this novel. And so my husband and I were able to go there in October of 2019. And um, I just, I wanted to kind of understand Paris during the occupation, which is like a very different time and place. And so I, I actually found a historian, Nigel Perrin was his name, and um, he gives historical tours of Paris and he's an expert in in Paris during the occupation and so um you know he showed me a lot of places that I had on my list to check off that I wanted to see but then also showed me places I didn't even know I, I should see or needed to see and really helped me shape the narrative of the story he was that was um, just incredible trip plus I mean it's Paris so it's always great but um it was really what he was wonderful resource um for that book 
Yeah, those are the sort of things you can't get from just going to the library or, read, you know, as you said, reading yes. the newspapers that sinking into the feeling of it. Yeah, like um, seeing just the bullet holes in the buildings and like different things that I wouldn't even know what to look for. That was really mm -hmm. amazing. Wow. Um, so Judy asks an interesting question that I've never really thought of when historical fiction is when you're writing, what kind of language do you use? Do you use the language of the time? Do you use the language of the time if they're speaking? I mean, how, is the narrator's voice yours? How does that work for you? And I think I'm starting with Bill this time. Um, well, with December 41, I, I got to watch a lot of old Hollywood movies uh, because what I wanted to do with it uh, was to, to give you a, a sense, as, a feeling as if you were living in a Hollywood movie. It's the first third of it is like film noir and the and the uh, the second third is a kind of classic train journey of the kind that you see in in old movies, and the uh, and the last section is sort of the Hitchcock thriller uh, with a lot of the Hitchcockian tropes of the nineteen forties movies as well. That's what I wanted to do, and so you know I've I've been steeped in movies all my life, and I I I've watched a lot of them in order to hear the patois and listen, know, know the writers to listen to, know what they were giving me as dialogue. That's a much more difficult thing uh, to accomplish when you're um, writing about pilgrims communicating. Uh, and you just have to adjust the, the metaphors that they will use and some of the syntax and things like that. Determining a voice in any one of these books is always a great challenge. Uh, starting with the question of whether you're going to write from the first person uh, point of view or uh, whether you're going to use a completely godlike 19th century uh, omniscient point of view. And every story is different and, uh, and presents you with its own set of challenges and its own set of, uh, of rewards as well. Um, but we could talk all night about uh, how to how to build a, a voice depending upon whether we're writing uh, a story from the 19th century or the 20th or the 21st. Mm -hmm. My books go back and forth in time. So I try to adjust the sound between the, the, uh, the past period uh, and the modern period which, in which I try to, I, I write with, um, you know, sort of um, almost a, a kind of a slangy um, and what I hope is a very fast, fast moving sort of co um, conversational tone. Mm -hmm. Jane? Mute, yes. So, um, you know, just, you know, a lot of what Bill said, I, th I think that there's a balance there between making it the language that in dialogue that people use accessible to people of now, but also make it feel authentic. And I feel like, you know, that that's a that's a balancing act that I feel I, I am constantly trying to be aware of. You want to include slang and dialect and and expressions of the time. But um, I feel like, so, you know, there's been a couple instances where I, I went too far and then it takes almost takes the reader out of the experience. So, I, yeah, I think I think it's a kind of for me, it's a constant balancing act. Mm -hmm. I would imagine. Margin, Marjan, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Um, you know, I agree with that. I think it's kind of like spices in cooking. Like if you do too much, it can be super overwhelming and you end up tasting almost nothing because it's almost too much. And if you do too little, it's very bland. For me in dealing with the past, I wasn't necessarily dealing with just how people spoke in America, though I was because I had scenes in the 1950s and 60s in the US, but also how people would have been speaking a foreign language. So there's always that challenge of how many words of the foreign, quote unquote, foreign language do you include for authenticity without it becoming distracting and annoying for the reader. So I think it's a fine balance, enough for the reader to get a sense that they're actually speaking a different language than English, but not so much that they feel like they're being taken out of the story. And with my American um, past, I did include the phrase easy peasy in the 60s. 
And I had one write, one reader write to me and say that people wouldn't have said that in the 60s. <laughs> and I was very crushed because, you know, with, with that kind of stuff, we went through it with such a fine tooth comb. Not just me, but the copy editor. Mm -hmm. so, right. Yeah. <laughs> Readers are rough. <laughs> Readers are rough. I've been there, Marjan. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, they wouldn't say the ETC thing. Gosh darn it. I got the, gosh, that's the coup, right? I think. <laughs> Easy peasy. Yeah. That's so funny. Um, so Elizabeth asks in the chat about um, over the course of your careers, are there any particular changes you've seen in the publishing, writing, editing, et cetera, landscape? What's your point of view on the increasing popularity of e popularity of ebooks and the impact of their existence. Um, that's an interesting question. And I do want to go back to the question about voice because I think that um, before answering that, um, audiobooks has really changed the way I hear books. You know, like I read them and I hear it in my own voice and then I listen to it and I'm like, well, that's completely different from what I expected. <laughs> so I don't know if you had that experience. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go back to the question about publishing and writing and changing in eBooks. Um, I don't know who I ended up with. I think I'm with starting with Jane. Um, yeah, you know, I think that the whole publishing industry has kind of been in flux for the past 10 years, and I think that's going to continue. But I think that we're all getting used to delivering um, stories through whatever medium people will you you know read them so whether mm -hmm. that's digital or audio audio is a growth market i think and and but a lot of people still love print i feel like you know um i i, I don't think books stories fiction is ever going away it's just going to be how it's delivered to people moving forward and that's why you see consolidation of publishing houses and and different things like that mm -hmm. my jam yeah i i agree with that and you know, I feel like there are things I think about and then there are things I don't think about. So I think about the characters, I think about the setting, I think about the language. I don't even, I don't even know where to start to think about the eBooks versus the print. Like there are people on your publishing team who worry about all that. So I just deliver the manuscript to the best of my ability, uh, you know, tell the story the best I can, as Bill was saying, and then all of that, like there are professionals who know what to do with that. And as far as the audio is concerned, it is very strange when you, you know, you hear your story being read. Maybe the pauses aren't where you would have paused. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, both my books, the people who have listened to the audio say wonderful things. So the, both actresses did an, an amazing job, but I myself could only listen to like a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they did such a great job and <laughs> I can't really listen. Also, it's weird to just listen to your own words. So. Mm -hmm. That's true. I, well, I can only imagine. <laughs> Bill? Well, uh, again, this is a topic we could talk all night on the, uh, uh, evolution of publishing across the 40 years that I've been involved with it. Um, however, I, I think Marjan is right in that uh, we, we should do what we do and let other people do what they do. And, uh, and our job is always to write the best book that we can and then uh, uh, leave it in the hands of others. Of course, when I began, there was a, a well-established system by which a large, large army of sales reps from whatever publisher would go about in their individual districts across the country uh, and go into individual bookstores and present the spring list in the fall and the fall list in the spring, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there was kind of an order and a system to it all. And, um, and then Barnes and Noble and Borders and um, a couple of other huge chains came along and began discounting. Uh, they, uh, they, they took books that were listed uh, in those days, say, I think my first book was $12.95, which was a lot of money. And they put those books at the back of the store so that people would walk through the store, stopping 
to see all of the remaindered art books and cookbooks and things like that, that these particular retailers had bought at a penny on the pound and pay five or $10 for those. And then they'd get a discount on the, the books that were on the, the current hardcovers that were at the back. Um, so we thought that was terrible, that the independent bookseller was being pressured and Barnes and Noble cut the independent and the other, the other big retailers cut the number of, um, of independent bookstores probably in half. Uh, and we all, we all thought, well, Borders and Barnes and Noble are fighting with each other and like two great dinosaurs, one of them will kill the other uh, and maybe they'll both die. And then the mammals will rise again, the independent booksellers who put your books in the window, not for a fee, but because they like the books and who will hand sell your books and do the things that spread the word, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we thought might happen. And none of us were contending with the giant asteroid coming toward earth called Amazon, which now accounts for over 50% of the book sales in America and uh, which built its massive retail power on the backs of the, basically on the back of the publishing industry uh, where they discounted even more than Barnes and Noble did. And like I say, I could go on all night about this, but, but that's, that's enough, I think, from me anyway. <laughs> well, I think it gives us an interesting perspective on the, you know, the timeline of how things have changed because some, yeah. you know, I remember Walden books too. Yeah, yeah. Well, but you see those, those book chains could help create, I mean, they helped to make my career in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, Walden books, an individual buyer at Walden books fell in love with my, uh, with Back Bay. And so suddenly it was in the front window in shopping malls all across America. Uh, that's, how, that's how it happened. It was a complete lightning strike. And uh, there was a Midwest retailer called Crocs and Brentanos, which was highly respected. You know, they had about a dozen stores and their buyer uh, fell in love with the book and offered a double your money back guarantee, which is, is unheard of today, <laughs> of course. Um, but uh, I think we're, we're getting away from the question of, uh, of the eBooks uh, and I guess the answer uh, on eBooks, which seem to have topped out in terms of the number of units that they sell and the, or the percentage that, that they sell, um, eBooks are just another way to, to tell the story. And we're storytellers. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we want to be able to do is just reach as large an audience as we possibly can. So... Mm -hmm. If ebooks are the way to do it, that's great. I happen to think independent bookstores contribute a lot to a community. Uh, any, any town that you live in that has a bookstore, it always seems to be a little bit more lively at night than, than towns that don't. Mm -hmm. And losing that kind of sense of community is something we don't want to have happen. I completely agree. And I'll put a plug in for libraries too. <laughs> Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because <laughs> we would have been hopping tonight if we'd done this in person. Yes. Right. Uh, can oh. I give a oh can I give a shout out for Haley Booksellers too? Because oh, yes. he helps organize so many of these wonderful library oh, yeah. events. And um Christmas is coming and you can order books from Haley Booksellers that signed books by all of us and a lot of other authors. Um so, and it's you know, especially after the last couple of years, it's awesome to support indie booksellers right now. So that's right. Absolutely. There, there is, there is no better present than a signed book. That's right. <laughs> oh, and I'll, I'll also add, I was an early reader of December Forty One, and I, it's so great, and it has this amazing old Hollywood feel. So, um, well, so thank you. Add that thank to your you. list. <laughs> well, you, you were very kind to give me the blurb that you gave. Oh, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. So, actually, as we are about out of time, I did want to say. Um, December 41, I, I think you said was coming out in June of next year. Yeah, it would have been nice in, in, uh, in December, but um, 
I was a little too slow in delivering. So that's okay. It, it'll be there for Father's Day. The bee tree. Yeah. <laughs> and Jane, your new book is coming out around 22, end of 22, 20, early 23. God willing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and can you remind us of the title? So the title is The American Actress, and um, it's based on the true story of Drew Layton, um, an actress in the 30s in Hollywood. Awesome. Wow. And Marjan, I know we talked about this. Do you want to put in a plug for anything? Um, well, it's a little triggering, the third book, and I'm still working on it. Um, the title is a secret as is the entire thing because I'm working on it. But um, it, 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 no, I, I do know I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit unfair to myself, but let's just say it will come out around no sooner than 2022. How about that? Uh, Marjan, can you talk a little bit about the TV deal too? I'm, I'm dying to oh, ask. Yeah, the TV deal is super exciting. Um, HBO uh, picked it up and we have Prentice Penny as the producer and my role will be consulting producer. And right now it's still in very early stages. So they're working on the pilot and, you know, fingers crossed, fingers crossed, God willing, it all goes through, but it's super duper exciting. And I keep so getting, exciting. yes, I keep getting emails from people who want to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they realize that I personally wish to be in it. No, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I get a lot of emails from actors in Hollywood who are like, oh. Oh. I, I don't know if they realize how little power I actually have. <laughs> That's amazing. You don't have that much power. To be but yes, yeah. It's if exciting. you get an email from Chris Hemsworth, could you just let me know? <laughs> let you know. Let you know. You I just think, want the address, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I want to stalk him or anything, but who would be your dream cast, though? Like, who would be your two main characters? Oh, I have learned the hard way to never, ever say that. Uh, uh, I've been asked that a lot, and I now learned my lesson. <laughs> okay. Whoever's right for the role, because whatever <laughs> it turns out to become kind of controversial. So, nope. Uh, I know that I know they'll do a great job casting. How about that? But I'll make sure it's realistic and good. How about that? Sounds good. Sounds great. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I think thank we you. had, a, you know, we talked about a lot of different things and um, I really appreciate your time and your honesty and your, uh, your humor. Um, I look forward to all of your books and I've enjoyed many of your books in the past and I think our attendees have as well. So Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh, yeah. Good night, good night everybody. Good night. Hello again, Jane. Good night. Yes, good to see you, you both in person next time. Yes, yes. that'll next be time in person. Definitely. Thank you, Mina. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Take Have care. us all to the library sometime yes. when we're it's all an, done with new books. And it's an right. open invitation. You can come anytime. You want to have coffee? I'm good with that too. And Dick <laughs> Haley, we'll bring him along too. Yes, oh, absolutely. Definitely.